All right, folks, welcome and thanks for listening. Jeff Horvitz here. I am happy to be here with you today and I hope you're all having a great day. I have a super busy program lined up for you today as usual. What a day though. Rarely are there such pivotal elections uh, and all hinging on one state, the election of Georgia, obviously, I'm talking about. And we shall see, maybe see some results here in just a bit. Um, I, I don't know. It might even be tomorrow by the time we get these. But but what's at stake is uh, slowing down the Democrat agenda. I, I say slowing down because I don't think you're stopping it right now because I think even if the Republicans maintain control of the uh, Senate, if they do that tonight, uh, there are still some very rhino-esque, uh, soft Republicans there. Think Mitt Romney, uh, think Murkowski, think uh, I, I, there's a handful. There's enough of them that, and I've been warning about this for for many weeks since the election, that even if the Republicans hold on to the Senate. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a De- Debbie Downer here. Um, I, I am just saying that even if they hold on to it, Rest assured, there are, they are gonna. There's gonna be some really weak Republicans that decide that are basically they're Democrats, but they're they're, they're rhinos, and they're gonna decide to work with Biden. And that's another point of conversation today. Um, is is the vote certification tomorrow that's happening in Congress? And what I want to get to is is I want to get to that and that whole constitutional process. But we'll see what happens tomorrow with the vote certification process. Two huge things happening here at once, the the Senate race in Georgia and then, of course, like I said, the certification. But the, the Senate race, focusing on that, even if the Republicans hold on, are, are there still going to be these rhinos that, that slip over and help introduce, you know, parts of the Green New Deal uh, or help introduce... You know, uh, what, what's it called? Uh, modern monetary theory and this, this idea that everybody gets a guaranteed income. The Andrew Yang plan, where, where money just uh, flows into everybody's account. And they're, they're gearing you up for this because you're already, you know, did you get your $600 stimulus check? Anyway, I want to talk about all this. And I am going to bring in someone who really knows his stuff. And we're going to do that uh, in the next hour. Uh, we're going to talk with the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus and one of the few reliable votes left in Congress. If you're a constitutional conservative, if you believe in a constitutional republic, he is one of maybe four dozen Republicans left. I mean, that, that, that didn't vote for this ridiculous uh, stimulus and spending package, this omnibus bill that passed a couple weeks ago, which sent money to Sudan and uh, to uh, where else? Um, Egypt sent money to Ukraine Sent money all around the world, billions of dollars that people are just got to be laughing at. Gender studies in Pakistan and all the domestic bills. But anyway, the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus, Congressman Andy Biggs, will join us and we'll get uh, deep into all that. And uh, we always appreciate when we hear from him. So he'll, he'll be here in the next hour. So I want you to stick around for that. If you got a comment, I want to start off with this, and I've got this hour, I want to get to a bunch of your comments, some education issues, and a, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but if you've got a comment, we have our Just Wireless listener line open for you. Uh, it's open 24-7. And I got a lot of comments that came in yesterday and are coming in even right now as we speak. So we're going we're gonna to get to those. So remember, 877-971-3971. Comment anytime you can be part of the program. You can also do it by email, talkwithjeff at iCloud.com. Always appreciate all of those emails. Uh, we'll get to comments here in just a second. I've got, I want to try to get to six or seven of these if we can. And um, we will have open lines tomorrow too. Uh, your live listener comments, Olivia will be standing by. Uh, Mark Howitt will join me and we'll we'll analyze and go over the, the results. I want to start off with something that I think was a, a kind of positive that I noticed happening yesterday on Monday. As you know, for most public schools, Yesterday was the first day back at school. <laughs> it's, you know, for a lot of kids though, like my kids, I have three kids. If you're, if you're new to the program, I, I have kids ranging from elementary school to middle school to high school. My daughter, Isabel, who does a bunch of production work, uh, and board work, work for the program. She's a senior in high school, believe it or not. Where does the time go, right? And, um, it's made me sad because she has been having to do virtual education since last March. This is in Flagstaff. Meanwhile, most schools 
have gone back to. Some of them may have pulled back recently because Arizona has a high COVID rate, um, according to reports. And a lot of people are, are getting it right now. So some of the schools went back to virtual learning for two weeks. Now, the secretary of uh, the superintendent of public instruction, Kate, Kathy Hoffman, Kathy Hoffman, do I have that right? Kathy Hoffman. Yeah. Katie Hobbs is the secretary of state. Kathy Hoffman, she, she was requesting that the governor, because of the spike in cases, discontinue in-person schooling uh, for at least two weeks uh, starting yesterday. He shot that down, fortunately. And we'll talk about Governor Ducey here in a little bit, some more as well. But at least he did that, and I'm happy for that. Should be a local decision. Should be a parental decision. But here's where I'm getting to. I am encouraged because when this all hit back in March, I was willing to give it a chance. Our public schools, our neighborhood schools, even our charter schools, which are really just public schools. I was willing to give it a chance and I get it. Uh, They got a hard job to try to corral the kids and deal with all kinds of conflicting interests with parents. But then, you know, school started back in August and it was virtual school. And then the cases went down and it was really, the case count was very small for COVID. And I was like, okay, it's time to go back. And then studies keep coming out showing that kids aren't as um, impacted for the most part by by COVID. And all these studies came out. And a lot of people agreed with that. Even European countries, Britain, for example, which is looking at an extended lockdown now. You know, most people are like, hey, send the kids back to school. So I was like, but, but Flagstaff didn't do it. So I was frustrated. And, and I was like, when are parents going to stand up and say enough is enough? I'm taking my kids out of these schools. Okay, so here's the optimistic part and the good thing about the new year and people just had enough. I'm seeing more and more posts from various parents who finally did it and they did it yesterday. They posted that I went to my school, I contacted my school, whatever. I'm seeing dozens of these and I'm done. I withdrew my kid. I'm homeschooling them now. Do you have any, these are on forums and, and so on and so forth. Do you have any advice as to how to homeschool them? And, you know, I put in a couple of comments. I don't have a lot of advice because my wife is doing most of this. She's using whatever resources she can find, including like Khan Academy for the math and so on and so forth. Plus, uh, you know, I'll teach my kids how to do my specialties. But there's the point I'm trying to make here is there's a lot more parents who have decided to yank their kids out of this system. And I am very happy today to see. I'm sad for the kids that, you know, they wanted to go back to school. They wanted to see their friends. But in the long run, the the kids are going to be so much better off. What we need is a mass amount of people to take their kids out of these public schools as quickly as possible. No matter what happens with COVID, no matter what happens with the education system as far as going to school in person or not, whatever. Schooling has changed forever. You know, if we're going to go back to the dinosaur age of of teaching school anymore, I'm not going to participate in that. Now, full disclosure, I have one kid who's homeschooled and he's excelling. He's doing awesome. And this is what I hear from most parents after they do it for a few weeks is, oh my God, I'm doing this stuff in like half the time. Uh, The daycare stuff is taken out of the equation. You know, you got half the classes like they're there for daycare. Okay, maybe I'm being a little... (laughs) I don't know what the exact number is, but you know what I'm talking about. A lot of these kids are there for, for, you know, they're dumped off at seven in the morning. They're picked up, you know, at dinner time. And I get it. It's tough out there. And, and people have started to rely and have relied on the government to watch their kids for a long time. But it's time to take our kids back and teach them the stuff they need to learn and stop teaching them the garbage that they don't need to know. Case in point, let me pull out an article here. Uh, There's this school, and I won't go too deep into this. This is ritzy, um, what is this, the collegefix.com. This is a ritzy New York City private school. This is a place, according to this article, where people spend $54,000 a year to attend this you know, elite school that, that Manhattanites like to send their kids to. This is just one example. This happens all over the country, believe me. Well, they, they put out their commitment to anti-racism, which includes in-depth anti-racism progress reports and all kinds of demands, other demands, as is, is this article goes into, that the teachers are making of the school and of the parents. Uh, things like volunteers and trustees should undergo yearly anti-racist training. And I don't want to, you know, you should be racist, but, but this is like the highlight of their whole thing, which is teaching all of this stuff 
Ensure that Dalton is partnered with Black-owned uh, business owners whenever possible. Offer a special orientation session for incoming students and families um, of underrepresented racial and ethnic backgrounds. Immediately divest from public, from private prisons and detention centers, companies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all the stuff. Expand the Office of Diversity. Commit to paying all Dalton employees uh, a minimum living wage. Uh, my point being is here's a school that... <laughs> People are spending, these parents are spending 50, these are obviously wealthy people, right? You're spending 54 grand to send your kids to these elite schools and they're teaching them garbage. So here we are, we're, you know, teaching our, trying to teach our kids at home. Like many people are now pulling their kids out, but we have an education system here in Arizona. We constantly hear, and I've got some numbers here that we're not spending enough money on our kids. I'm like, well, I'm not spending barely any money on my kids. I'm teaching them at home. So what does that have to do with anything? But yet we're spending in Arizona about $10,000 per student. Nationwide, the average is about, according to a 2018 census data report, about $12,612 per student is being spent. And Arizona always ranks the lowest at nine or 10000 or whatever it is. And they always say it's not enough money. But then you, you got these, these teachers where kids are spending $54,000 or, or t- parents are spending $54,000 to send their kids to. Apparently that's enough, but they're teaching them all this garbage. So I started thinking about this and I'm like, I'm homeschooling my kid. Where's my tax credit? Why is this $10,000 going into the system? You know, what's happening with all this money for all these parents that are pulling their kids out of school? You know, I, I, I don't get any money. I don't even want any money. I just want them out of my education system, but they're still getting all this money. So where's it all going as people pull their kids out of these schools? And I, I just, I'm shocked that more haven't pulled their kids out of these public schools, but I think it's coming. And I think more and more people are going to do this unless they start losing the money. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, now we got to go back to school. Now it's safe to go back to school because we're losing all of this money. So we'll see what happens. But anyway, I'm encouraged. I'm optimistic to see the dozens of parents and families that just yesterday, they were like, I'm done. I'm pulling my kids out of this stuff and I'm going to have to teach my kids myself. I'm going to have to do the homeschooling or I'm looking at private options, which you'll have to, you'll have to pay for. And I think, that's, uh, I think that's very good news. And I'd love to hear from you. If you are in that situation where you've pulled your kids out of school, I'd like to know why. Um, you know, or if your grandkids were pulled out and how are they doing? Are they excelling? I'd love to hear from you because I think this is really interesting to see um, this positive aspect come out of COVID and these overbearing school boards and government officials who, you know, thought really think that the, the, the kids are theirs. They're not. And people are taking control of that and taking their, their kids back. And uh, it's it's a good trend. I'd love to hear from you, 877-971-3971. Go ahead and chime in on the Just Wireless listener line. Hey, don't forget, um, please go to talkwithjeff.com. I uh, appreciate everyone who listens on 97.1 The Big Talker. Um, and, and we reach a lot of people every day. And I'm, I'm really excited for that and, and honored to do that. And, and it's it's a great honor and privilege to do this show every day. Uh, we want to expand, though, anyone who listens in other formats, like Spotify, you know, the podcast, the, the just audio only podcast, but also YouTube, which you can do video um, and you can also just listen to. So please go to talkwithjeff.com, like and subscribe to your favorite medium outside of our normal FM broadcast, including subscribing to the YouTube channel. I really, really appreciate that. When we come back, uh, I got a bunch of comments I want to spend the next rest of the hour get that out um going over listening to responding to your comments because there is a ton of them still coming in and you still have time to get your comments in 877-971-3971 and don't forget tomorrow wednesday is open line wednesday with with uh, mark howitt and olivia will be joining me and two full hours we will do your live listener comments and would, would really first show of the new year of live listener comments would love you to chime in especially the vote certification in dc and the georgia runoff race folks hang tight back in a minute
You're listening to The Jeff Orovitz Show. All right, folks, welcome back. Jeff Orovitz here. And uh, stick around because coming up here in the next hour, we will have Congressman Andy Biggs, the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. And uh, he's going to fill us in on the whole process that's going on in D.C. tomorrow for the vote certification, as well as uh, his thoughts, his expectations on the Georgia Senate runoff. So really looking forward to getting caught up with uh, someone who spends a lot of time on the show. And I really appreciate that, Congressman uh, Andy Biggs. Uh, Real quick, before I get to start going through comments here, I, I just want to mention this. If you... Back to my education comments of last segment. If you are, if you still have your kids in the public school system, two experiences that I've had, um, or, or something that I should, I would warn about is always be careful about the, the curriculum because I've learned this as we've monitored our kids' curriculum at since they're home. But also watch the specialists they bring in or the outside educators they bring in because my experience has been that they don't need to get uh, board approval for this. You could have a rogue teacher and we got a lot of fine teachers. Don't get me wrong, but there are also some rogue ones that want to cram down their ideology uh, into the system and into the kids. Two quick examples before I get to your comments. Uh, There is the time when in Flagstaff, the, and you may have heard this, a little clip of this during our thousands show celebration earlier or late last year, um, where they brought in these, this group to talk about the infinite number of genders and this gender study thing or gender, uh, gender issues huge. I mean, they're, they're even trying to push it off on Pakistanis and <laughs> folks overseas at this point, but they brought in this, it was an outside group that they brought in to educate the kids on the infinite universe of genders. And, and I don't, I haven't seen this happen in Flagstaff again, but believe me, it's happening somewhere. So I would just warn you to watch for the permission slips you sign. Oftentimes they will have permission slips. Sometimes they don't for the outside groups. You need to be aware of, well, what is this? And, and really dig into it because sometimes they mask it with um, very fluffy wording and you would never think that they were learning about the infinite number of genders, including cyborg. Another thing, I mean, I had a teacher once or an out, not a teacher, but an outside group group come into my uh, daughter's, this was quite a few years ago, uh, it may be kindergarten or, or first grade, and they were talking about saving the forest, which I want to save the forest. I love the forest. You know that. I'm always out there. But they started talking about and preaching that you can't cut down any of the trees. You can't cut down any of the trees. Why? Well, because an animal might live in there. And okay, yeah, I, I don't want to cut down a tree with a, you know, a, a whatever in there, right? A squirrel nest or something. Uh, but I, I, my, my, my daughter at the time comes home. She's like, well, because we cut firewood, as you know. And so we go into the forest. And generally speaking, you're not, you're not cutting down in, in most circumstances, unless you're on private property, uh, the way the national forest is, you're not cutting down the live standing trees. Um, there are, you can cut down, last I checked, uh, dead standing like ponderosa and stuff, but the, like the oak has to be fallen down, things like that. Aspen, you know, only certain times a year, but not to bore you to all those details. But generally speaking, you're not going down and cutting down live trees in most situations. But this person was in there in the classroom, like saying, Hey, you can't cut down any trees. And so we had to, in that instance, that's just something we caught. Just one example here outside group, we had to kind of re educate our daughter at the time and say, Well, wait a second. First of all, there's too many trees in the forest. And I know people will hear that and say, oh, you want to clear cut all the trees? No, I mean, the forests are so thick, they can't even get anyone to go in there and cut them down. And we said, yeah, there could be animals in them, but you know, may, probably not. And the reality is we can cut our own wood here locally and heat our home. You know, and plus you need wood for making plywood and wood products and all this. But they, would act, they had it in, in our, our daughter's head from this one outside group that you can't cut down the trees. Because you're going to kill, you know, I don't know, what's the name of an owl or something? I don't know, an owl or something, <laughs> you know? So and that's not to, not, not to beat this one to death. Know what your kids are learning. We all need to take back our kids' education. We need to take back our kids' education and know, even if you're not going to homeschool, know what the books are. Know what the teachers are. You probably look up most of them on social media and have an understanding. I'm not saying that all everybody needs to agree and be, you need to be a conservative, you need to be a liberal or this or that. Just saying, just teaching them the basic stuff without their biases as as humanly, uh, as much as humanly possible. 
Okay, let's get to some comments. Just my thought on education. I'd love to hear from you. 877-971-3971. 877-971-3971. Let's start off with this one here. Yeah, this is Ed from Flagstaff, a longtime Flagstaff resident. Jeff, I'm getting so tired of you whining about the national debt, etc. There's not a damn thing you can do about it, nor can I do about it. So why do you waste their time? Okay, and as far as having oh, your guests come in on Wednesday when it's supposed to be open line, you use the screening that I'm talking to to screen the topics. And very rarely on a Wednesday, like when you have Joe Golly in, can people call and ask him questions because you've dominated two hours of talking about stuff with him. So a suggestion would be select another day that you can respond and interact with your listeners. Thank you. All right, Ed. Um, well, first of all, Ed, I appreciate the comment. I actually have another one. It looks like we got another one lined up for Ed, but we'll get to that in just a second. Ed had a, Ed was fired up. Um, I appreciate the comment. And I hope that tomorrow, Open Line Wednesday, you will chime in. We'll have two full hours of your live listener comments. I generally don't bring in uh, interview guests on Wednesdays. Wednesday is typically reserved for Open Line Wednesday. Last last week it wasn't because we didn't do it at the end of the year. Uh, but generally speaking, we do Open Line Wednesdays every week. There's some exceptions, but we generally do it every Wednesday, and everybody has the opportunity to call in. We we Olivia will take the calls and do some screening as far as, you know, can you string sentences together and basic stuff like that. But as far as uh, saying, oh, you can't talk about this topic or that, no, we're, we're pretty open. It's Open Line Wednesday, Ed, and you are welcome to call in and participate in Open Line Wednesday. Uh, actually, I hope you do tomorrow. I hope you're listening right now. I hope you jot it down, starting right at 4.06. Ed, that's for you. Line up. We will. I am putting a standing order out there. Ed is to get through no matter what because we. I want you to participate. But generally, no, I, I think I've had Joe Galley supposed to be on, I think, Thursday this week. He had to reschedule earlier this week. He's from the Greater Flagstaff Chamber of Commerce. I try not to have interview type guests where we're just going to be talking with them. Once in a while, if there's a special thing going on tomorrow, if Eric Trump or Donald Trump Jr. wants to call in to talk about the Senate race in Georgia, we will open the line for that for for him. And and, and with all due respect, we're probably not going to open up the line, Ed, for you to ask, you know, Donald Trump Jr. questions. I mean, it's just not going to work like that, but we'll leave it open for you. But back to your other comment. What was the other comment? I already forgot. Uh, Remind me. Remind me. Oh, the debt. Okay. (laughs) Why would I stop talking about this? I get it. I I admitted yesterday, and for folks that can can watch back on YouTube, um, I pulled up all these stats yesterday about the national debt. Let's pull it up. Let's pull it up one more time here. National debt from usdebtclock.org. Uh, this was a snapshot yesterday, so I'm sure it's much higher. It's nearly twenty eight trillion dollars. $83,000 per person, $220,000 per taxpayer. The federal deficit is $3 trillion. Really, it's probably more closer to like four, probably going to get, get over five or six uh, with Biden. It's crazy. Debt to GDP ratio is, is like 134%. This is 130, but I don't think this is right. Why would I stop talking about that? I know, Ed. I know that there's nothing that we can do about it. That's the point. You can't keep adding to this thing, Ed. So yeah, I'm going to bring it up from time to time. And in the beginning of the, the first show of 2021, yesterday, I went through all the different time periods and how much debt we have and the debt to GDP ratio. you find that on YouTube. Go check it out. Go to talkwithjeff.com if you missed it. I know it's a little dry sometimes when you talk about that. But the reality is we have to talk about it. We have to talk about it. How can we not talk about the fact that our country is 134% debt to GDP ratio? How can we not do that? And I know that they can't fix it. They don't even want to fix it, Ed. I know that. I acknowledge that. I acknowledged it on on the program yesterday. But we still got to talk about it because I want folks to understand, and most of you do, the ramifications of this much debt. And what are they going to do? Look, there's they always pull a rabbit out of their hat, but eventually they won't be able to. Are they going to just stop printing the money? And what will happen? Stop extending the credit? 
what will happen then is things will deflate and, and there will be pitch pitchforks and torches. Or the opposite side, which I think is the most likely scenario, is they're just going to keep pumping it in. And they're already priming you with these stimulus checks. So the IRS just deposits money right into your checking account. Eventually, they'll do it and say, Ed, we're going to deposit $2,000 in your account. You got one month to spend it or it's going to go away. We're going to do negative interest rates on you, Ed. And uh, that money will slowly uh, chip away. So I do it more as so you know. And I know a lot of you know, but you're reminded how out of control these people actually are. And we'll talk about this coming up with Congressman Biggs in the five o'clock hour. But I think it's important to keep it out there, Ed, and to make sure that people understand the ramifications of what they're doing and to prepare yourself. I talked about the, uh, the ammunition yesterday. I think I talked about that. I've been looking for replacement ammunition uh, after going out with my kids and doing some quail hunting, which we didn't get anything. Um, and... Uh, you know, practicing, you can't find any, can't find any screws, everything. If you can't find it, the price is going up a lot. So be prepared, be prepared. Know that there's this massive amount of debt out there. And eventually I know maybe like most people, like Jerry neighbor says, most people just don't care. I get it. Our politicians don't care. The general population don't care. And you apparently don't care. I do though. Appreciate the comment. Love to hear from you. Folks, go ahead and chime in. The Just Wireless listener line's open just for you, 877-971-3971. When we come back, I've got more comments. Plus, stick around. Uh, Congressman Andy Biggs, chairman of the House Freedom Caucus, is going to join us in the next hour. Uh, and, and don't forget, go to talkwithjeff.com. Please subscribe to all the podcasts, the YouTube channel, the social media, all of that. Folks, hang tight. Back in a minute. You're listening to The Jeff Orvitz Show. All right, folks, welcome back. Jeff Orvitz here, and we will have Congressman Andy Biggs in the, in the next segment after the 5 o'clock hour, next hour, so stick around for that. We got to get the nuts and bolts here of how the vote certification process will work. What's the constitutional process tomorrow um, in, in Congress? And he's going he's gonna to break it down for us. Plus, uh, what to expect from Georgia tonight, this pivotal just so much is 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 waiting weighing down uh or so much is contingent upon uh this election here tonight in control of the senate i i in a long term I, i'm not optimistic about these politicians but i know where the democrats are taking us and at least if we have the republican control of the senate for most things, it'll be a check and it'll be a divided government to try to slow down some of this radical leftist stuff that's just inundating the country. Uh, so we will we'll talk about con- with Congressman Biggs about that. Let's do another comment. Here's another one. Ed's fired up. So another comment, again, a 24-7 Just Wireless listener line open just for you. You can leave comments anytime, 877-971-3971. Yeah, uh, Ed Flagstaff, uh, Jeff, you commented that you're going to get a check for $2,300.28, but you also said you didn't really need it. Uh, I'm anxious to know who you're going to donate it to. And if you're not going to donate it, uh, I'd like to know why not. There are lots of nonprofits in this town that could use a donation of $2,300.28. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Appreciate your con- I think it was 22 cents. I had to do this other one with Ed because Ed, uh, okay, back, some background here. Yesterday I said that I, you know, they, they, they screwed this stimulus up. Uh, first of all, they shouldn't have done any stimulus. The states that are closed should not be getting uh, backstopped by the federal government and the taxpayers of the nation. They should open back up. They should follow the example of Florida and Texas and even mostly to a degree now. <laughs> you know, we, we had some hiccups at first. Governor Ducey went way off the rails at first. He's still off the rails on some things. But <laughs> we should follow that, that example. Not locked down. We shouldn't be backstopping that, Ed. We shouldn't even be helping them out on a federal level. It's a state issue. But to your point, yesterday I said that and I, I said this when they first voted for this stupid stimulus package, that there's a lot of people, and Ed, you know them, I know them, 
that don't need the stimulus check. And I also said, if you're going to send me, I'm doing air quotes for people who watch back on YouTube, if you're going to send me free money, yeah, you know, okay, I'm going to take it. Now, what am I going to do with that money? Well, none of your business, quite honestly. And it, you make a presumption in your comment that uh, I don't give to charity or I don't do anything. Whether I do or not is none of your business. I can tell you my family does. I can also tell you that being in the rental business, there are a lot of families that we help out every year <laughs> in a lot of rent subsidies. I would ask you, how many families do you provide for, Ed, with rent subsidies? I'm not trying to pick on you here, but it's a kind of a condescending comment you're making. You know, what? if I get $2,200 and 22 cents or whatever the heck they sent, you know what, what am I going to do with it? I don't know. I'm probably going to convert it out of dollars <laughs> would be my first thing. Maybe I'll buy some screws or some, uh, some, some, some ammunition or some silver. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> Anything. Toilet paper. Uh, but don't make the assumption that, you know, Ed, just because someone says, hey, uh, my point I'm trying to make when I say I don't need it is to try to point out that there are millions of Americans that are getting these checks that shouldn't have gotten them. And we didn't solve any problem here. If the problem is 30 or 40 million people are facing eviction because they lost their job because of COVID or whatever the case may be, well, that's one thing. Congress should have voted on a package to assist those folks. And I can talk to that specifically because I'm in the rental business and we've had people that have truly been affected and impacted that we work with and that landlords who get a bad name all the time, Ed. They get a bad name all the time. They're all dirt bags. If you, if you read the, the mainstream press and listen to the politicians, most of them. But the reality is most that I know when someone calls and says, I lost my job because of COVID and I need some help. Most landlords, the vast majority are going to say, let me help you out. And they're going to work with them. So why the heck didn't Congress do a package to help the landlords out? To keep these people in. And I laid this out, Ed. You may have missed the show. I said, I'd be willing to forgive past due amounts. Forgive. And then take a reduced amount, even for a guaranteed period of time, three months into the future, whatever. Okay, fine. I'm going to forgive the past due amount. Yeah, that person owes five grand, Ed. And my family subsidized their housing. I, okay, I can live with that. You know, some landlords can't. Don't get me wrong. And okay, feds, you want to help these people out that are going to be evicted, you know, according to your numbers. Well, I'll, I'll take 25% off the next three months. Why don't you prepay that direct to our, you know, our rental company, whatever, personally, whatever, however you hold it. And we'll help them out. That's fine. But no, no, they didn't do that. They sent us people 600 bucks. So, so Ed... I hope you call tomorrow. I appreciate comments, Ed. And I hope you'll participate in Open Line Wednesday tomorrow. 877-971-3971. Here's another. Hey, Jeff. Uh, here's a suggestion for people with $600. Maybe they do what I did. I gave $300 to uh, wait staff. I went out to eat in restaurants in December. And just a couple of days ago, I gave $300 to a small business owner that needed it. So, I mean, if you don't need the money, just pass it on to people that do. I mean, you don't have to be greedy or something like that. They just do something right for people. Yeah, I hear. Hey, thank you. And I think people took what I said the wrong way yesterday. And um, I, 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 not being greedy here. You're going to take the money. What I do with it on my own is up to me. But the point is they, they shouldn't have. They shouldn't have just blanket sent everyone this money. They're going to keep doing it. Uh, but no, that's good Good for you. That was a good thing, uh, especially these folks working at these restaurants who uh, definitely have been impacted and have felt the negative effects of less people being in the restaurants. They've also felt, if you're in Flagstaff, don't forget, I forgot to mention this yesterday, January 1st, the minimum wage went up to $15 an hour. So that impacts the menu prices. And we did a great piece last week. Uh, I think it was last Wednesday. Check it out at talkwithjeff.com about the menu that was accidentally given to us at a restaurant that had the pre, the 2020 menu was given to us at, at, at our table. My family went out and the 2021 menu was accidentally given to us and prices were 30% higher. So people will go out to eat less, perhaps, and then those servers who are already dealing with maybe less tables because of restrictions on capacity are getting less tips. They're getting less tips because the minimum wage is 15. So some people are like, I haven't done this. I still tip the same amount. They have to offer awful service for me to 
you know, go down on that because I, I used to wait on tables. Uh, back before I was a, <laughs> back before I was a greedy landlord, I waited on tables and, um, it was, it was a good job to have and, and taught me how to hustle. Um, so I understand how, how tough of a job that can be, but I think that some people are tipping less because they're like, Hey, this person's making a lot more than, you know, uh, they used to make at half the minimum wage or whatever it is, but good comment. No. And again, back to the same thing that Ed was saying, don't, don't assume because I said, Hey, I don't need the money because I'm speaking. I think I'm, there's a lot of people that need the money. I get it. There's a lot of people that are hard up and not well off in this situation. There are a lot of businesses that are struggling, going out of business, but there are also many people that are prospering and many people that have had their best year ever. I'm not making this up. There are plenty of people. Go talk to a lot of people that are having their best year ever. And they'd say like, why, why did the government just send me $2,200 or $600 or whatever? That was my point. They're doing it wrong, but that's the government. That's why they shouldn't do this stuff because they always get it wrong. Appreciate the comment. Go ahead and chime in, folks. 877-971-3971. Here's another one. Yes, uh, yes. regarding the uh, stimulus checks and the amount, and the wherewithal behind them or what's going to sustain it. Uh, my big concern, I was looking at some of the numbers the other day, and it said we saw the, the president signed $900 billion stimulus package, of which only $166 billion went for the 600 plus or minus so-called stimulus checks. So I'm thinking... Why didn't this bill, why weren't these bills stand alone? You could have increased the checks many times if you didn't add all the other pork in there. So very discouraged at our politicians and even a little bit at uh, President Trump for suggesting we keep sending out these stimulus checks, which could maybe in a few years become universal income, which I'm sure nobody would object, as you stated yourself, that if you got free money, you would take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, good comment. I would take it knowing the ramifications. I mean, I, they're sending a blanket check to everybody. I'm not going to be the only fool. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the helicopters are flying up above dropping money. I mean, come on. No, but I, I don't want it. And I know Ed will have another call, and Ed, hope you call tomorrow. Um, you know, so I, I should do X, Y, and Z. But no, the point is they're, d- they're doing this universe. They're, d- d- they're doing it wrong. Um, but I agree with you. Why would you send, you know, you talk about, and I was disappointed with Trump as well, as far as signing that. I was disappointed with many, most of, you know, the House and the Senate that voted for this thing. But if you were going to do, if you were going to send anyone money, you wouldn't send it to Sudan and Egypt and all these other places. You send it to the American folks that are struggling first. I don't agree with sending checks because I think when we're sitting and having arguments as, you know, Republicans in Congress are having arguments that, oh, no, 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 $1,200, that's crazy. That's socialism. <laughs> but $600 ain't or $2,000, you know, that's, that's, that's crazy talk. No, just send six hundred. I think you're just you're you're just talking degrees of socialism at that point. So I, I totally disagree with the whole philosophy of stimulus. But you would send your people money <laughs> before you would send money to foreign countries. I get that. But my point about they shouldn't have sent it to all of us because there's many think about all the folks who haven't lost an hour of work during COVID. Uh, Think about all the people working in different government positions. I'm not picking on you. I know there's a lot of jobs out there that are needed, but the reality is you have a secure job. And I know as soon as I say that, somebody will call and say, I was let go of my government job. I I get it. I'm I'm not trying to talk in absolutes. But in general, you have a secure job. There's a lot of people. There must be hundreds of thousands of them in Washington, D.C. that are sitting in their cubicle thinking of stuff. Um that didn't lose their job. They didn't lose any hours. They may be working more. Why? Why would you get a stimulus check? That's my point here. So if you were to uh, reduce those people, take them out of the equation and truly figure out a way to help people out short term that are about to lose their home or something. Okay. It's one argument. You would have more money. You'd have more money to send and instead of sending $600 to someone who's five months behind on their rent because they got COVID or lost their job because of COVID, you'd have a lot more to help that 
landlord tenant relationship or that uh, the, the insurance company, you know, the, the people can't pay their insurance, their medical insurance. So uh, some kind of help with that. I, you know what I mean? It's just all wrong. They, they just got it all wrong uh, once again. All right, let's do one more before we go to break and before we get to uh, our interview with Congressman Andy Biggs, 877-971-3971, the Just Wireless 24-7 listener line. Uh, hi, Jeff. My name is Paul from Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, the suggestion you're asking for is what would we like for the city to do for us and at this time rather than paper over a lot of governmental mistakes I would like the councilwoman, I think her name was Sputanova, that's how I call her, I would like to require her to come back to the city and operate a small business uh, starting January 1st when the minimum wage goes up uh, at her bequest and how she pushed that one through. And I'd like to require her to operate a small business uh, with her own money or maybe with the money that she received from the government and see how well she does in the environment that she helped create to, for a difficult business climate for some of the smaller businesses in Flagstaff. Thank you, Jeff. That, is a, that is a great, I can't add much more to that. I really appreciate that comment. Uh, and he's referring to former Flagstaff City Councilwoman Eva Putsova, who is almost solely responsible for the minimum wage in Flagstaff, one of the highest minimum wages in the nation. She then ran for Congress in the primary against Tom O'Halloran and lost. Uh, but no, that is one of the greatest. Yeah. Can you operate a small business under these conditions in this environment. Uh, I would offer that uh, as good training and understanding for anyone in a cubicle with a clipboard from the government. All right. Appreciate we got through five of the six I wanted to get through, and that's pretty good. We will uh, continue comments tomorrow. Remember, starting at 4.06 on 97.1 The Big Talker, we will have two full hours, open line Wednesday, your live listener comments. And yes, you will get through. I, I can't guarantee that everybody gets on. If we can, we can usually take around 10 to 12 calls in that period. We'll try to get more. Ed, I really want you to line up and call. I want to hear from you, but you're all welcome tomorrow starting at 406. But don't go anywhere because coming up next, uh, we're going to get the lowdown as to what, or is it the down low or the low down, down low, <laughs> whatever it is, we're going to get it from the chairman of the House Freedom, Freedom Caucus, Congressman Andy Biggs. Folks, hang tight. Back in a minute. You're listening to The Jeff Orovitz Show. All right, folks, uh, welcome back. And I'm very happy to have back on the program the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus, Congressman Andy Biggs. Congressman, Happy New Year. Hey, Happy New Year to you too, Jeff. It is, you know, it's a happy new year. I mean, it's, there's a lot to be worried about, though. I mean, but there's still a lot of opportunities out there. Yeah, no, it's, look, um, we, we just came out of a, a, a really tough year, 2020. I think we're starting off 2021 in, in a pretty tough shape. And, you know, you, you just got to keep smiling, keep optimistic, keep putting your head down one foot in front of the other. But uh, uh, we're, we're, we're facing some, some challenges as, in, as states and families and communities and, and certainly as a country. Yeah, for, for sure, Congressman. Well, what do you think? Uh, it is the big day, uh, the Georgia runoff. Um, we, we'll see if we even see the results tonight. Uh, we never know with elections nowadays, but what's your kind of thoughts on that? Lay, lay it out for us. Well, I think it's it's really close. It's, it's almost impossible to get at what's, uh, how that's going to go. Uh, it's, it's so close um, that pollsters actually quit, kind of quit taking polls and and uh uh you know i'm hopeful but uh democrats had a bit of a lead from the early balloting and in returned ballots and hopefully republicans get out there and vote like uh, like mad today yeah I, I hope that's the case because um, you know, I've had a lot of concerns, Congressman, with the way some of your colleagues have been voting. Uh, I've talked about it a lot on the show. Um, you stood your ground on the stimulus here uh, just a week or two ago. Um, there wasn't a lot of you, though. I mean, it was like 50, maybe, in the House. All, all Republicans, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's right. Um, no, I mean, but 
but it's it's worse. I mean, so so <laughs> so I like I, 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 I like to liken it to this. Uh, Democrats uh, want to uh, go off the speed of of light over the over the cliff uh, on so many things, and Republicans are at least going uh, the speed limit as they're approaching the cliff. So mm-hmm. uh, the matter is, what that means is we can actually turn. Uh, if the Republicans uh, have control, we can turn a lot easier than if the Democrats are in control. Yeah. So, I mean, let's play this out for folks who maybe don't pay attention every day, Congressman. I mean, this it's a super slim majority in the Senate. By, by the way, real quick, how, how close did the um, – it tightened up in the House this past election. Uh, right. I, I mean, Pelosi just barely got back in. Uh, not Not her election, but a speaker. Right. That's right. So – they're sitting about, I want to say, 222 um, right now. We're about 212, to, and, and you've got a couple of kind of contested seats that were that are still that still haven't been resolved mm-hmm. that should go Republican way. So the, it's going to be the cl- tightest, smallest margin in a century um, between the two parties. Okay, and then on the Senate side, this race in Georgia means what? I mean, if if they lose, it's that tight. Yeah, so right now you have 50 Republicans and 48 uh, Democrats in the Senate uh, in the Senate and you got these two seats. And what that means is if the Democrats win that, then it's 50-50, that means whoever's the vice president will be the president of the Senate and will break all tie votes. Okay. So so that's how critical uh, the Georgia vote is. Absolutely. Okay, so let's fast forward because there's not enough going on today and really into tomorrow as they're tabulating votes, I'm sure. But tomorrow, the it is tomorrow, correct? The, the, the process right. starts for the uh, certification in Congress of the presidential election. Walk us through that. So what happens is when we, when we get together, it's a joint session. So you have all the senators, all the, all the um, members of, of the House will be in the on the house floor vice president in the chair uh, it's a joint session uh it starts you you pray you pledge and then the, the vice president uh, doesn't really even say anything just says these are the electors and goes forward he's, and he goes state by state alphabetically and then you get to arizona and um we have a significant number of people who will be objecting in the house and in the senate to the seating or the counting of the electoral votes from arizona okay and and then what happens is there's an immediate um, recess, and the senators leave the house and go back across the, the the Capitol to the Senate chambers, and they start their two hours of debate, and we have our two hours of debate. It's run by uh, Speaker Pelosi in the House and uh, uh, Leader McConnell in the Senate, and nobody can speak more than five minutes, and they has to be, be an hour uh, of positive or pro. Uh, seating the electors, which would be the Democrat side, and then an hour uh, in opposition to seating the electors, and that would be our side. Okay. And you plan on, you've been on the record, you plan on objecting to the, the certification process tomorrow in the House. You said when it gets to Arizona, you expect several. Yes. I know. Oh, yeah. Go I ahead. Do. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah there, there'll be a significant number. I'm looking at a list now, and it's, it's pretty it's pretty full. There'll be dozens. There'll be dozens, um, if if not more, uh, that object, and then what'll happen is after we have the debate, then there's a floor vote in each each body, and in order to um, keep those electors from being seated, you need the the House and the Senate. You need both chambers have got to vote not to seat the electors, and of course the Democrats do have the majority. It's a small majority, but they have the majority. They will vote lockstep to seat those electors. Okay, so playing this out tomorrow, Congressman, you, you I mean you get to Arizona, you go in alphabetical order here, so Arizona's pretty quick on the roll there. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we. Yeah, we're very. We'll be. What are we? The third state. Okay, so you take you object, and maybe some of your colleagues. I would assume Congressman Gosar, for example. Uh, yes, and, and, and yeah, others. Paul, will, Paul uh, Jeff, Paul is going to make the election. We went with the the senior member of the, the Arizona delegation to. Uh, of the Arizona Republican delegation to make the oral objection, and then, then um, we're trying to organize our our time to know who's going to speak. Et okay, but that only takes one. So at that point, it recesses, goes back to the Senate. 
That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So this will probably happen pretty quickly because I imagine there's other states too that have folks that would like to do this. Um, that's right. Okay. That's right. So, you, so you're looking at six states. Okay. Um, that that might have that happen, but uh, I, I'm I'm thinking you're going to get three or four states, maybe mm-hmm. five. Okay. Um, where where there's objections and and you have a debate, yeah. Okay, and, and again, I'm just trying to because we all don't follow this, and so playing this out. So it goes right. goes to the Senate. The Senate debates this right now. The Republicans control the Senate. What is it, fifty two to forty eight or something like that? It's 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 fifty to forty eight. Fifty to forty eight because of two. Okay. Okay, yeah. so you would, is there the votes with the Republican majority uh, in the Senate? What I ha- don't believe so. Okay, so if it goes, so, so, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, so the way to think about this is, you've got forty eight, you got forty eight Democrats. You know they're all going to vote to seat the electors, mm-hmm. and so you, you got to get fifty one not to. So you know, um, Tom Cotton has said that he is not going to vote to object. Um, Lindsey Graham said he's not going to object. So all, all of a sudden it's 50, 48, um, uh, 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 against the objection. Okay. Then you have, then you have people like Mitt Romney that's been critical and, and Murkowski and Susan Collins and, and Ben Sass have also been critical. So my guess is, um, this is going to be very challenging for us to even even come close to breaking even in the Senate. Okay. And then it goes and back, and then it goes back to the House. Even if it failed in the Senate, does it still come back no, to the so House, or is it over? They're, they're, they're simultaneous. Okay. They're okay. simultaneous. So while, we're, while they're debating, we're debating. While they're voting, we're voting. And then um, it, it's, it's such a long shot. Um, yeah for this to for these electors not to be seated okay so we kind of see the writing on the wall there what 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 may happen tomorrow what happens afterwards congressman and i know you and i have spent show after show talking about this i've got listeners calling all the times they're at their wits end they're so frustrated you know it you hear it you've got people um shall i use the word converging on washington right now and even here at the state capitol there's a whole bunch of folks down there i assume capitals around the country so tomorrow the biden gets certified for biden and biden's coming in here i mean what what's the next step here what happens well a lot of it depends on what happens in georgia if if the republicans win in georgia and we maintain control in the senate then what happens is the Senate becomes the backstop for all of the crazy left-wing socialist policies that are going to be promulgated by by the Democrats in the House. If the Senate goes, and and I don't know if you followed it, uh, Ossoff and um, um, the other guy, I can't remember his name, uh, from Georgia, if you follow those guys and look at what they've said, they're, you know, they're, they're the defund police. They're the, the, you know, free freebies to everybody that free college for all free Medicare for all of everything's free. Um, so you start moving in a socialist trend and, and, and something we haven't talked about, Jeff, is that the rules package that was approved by the Democrats in, in the house, um, facilitates and takes some safeguards off um, and uh, that would normally slow down uh, the Democrats. They they took those safeguards off, so so they can do things like the Green New Deal a lot easier than they otherwise would. So you're talking about them planning to go pedal to the metal um, on a hard left tack. And don't forget too, um, I, I spoke to um, a very senior. Homeland Security folks last week about what's happening on our border. Yeah, because because of what President Trump did, Title Forty Two, we're turning away more people that are trying to sneak into our country than we were during the surge. And if Biden takes that off, which he has said he's going to do, he won't be able to turn them away, and we will immediately move into a surge of open border issues, like we had. Uh, when all the caravans were coming up here in 2019. So we're facing just an absolute huge uh, series and set of problems, uh, depending on who takes those two Georgia Senate seats coming up tomorrow. And do you think that even with the let's let's see, let's say it goes to the Republicans tomorrow and they, they hold the Senate. 
Um, isn't there still, don't you still have concern? And I'll just, I'll go first here. I have concern that in a, on a lot of things, it's still going to be iffy because you've got a couple of weak Republican senators. Uh, just call it like it is. Well, you do. Uh, you've got some senators who think very differently than than I do on whether it's immigration or spending, or you got a bunch of war hawks in the Senate. Um, you've got, um, you just name it. They're, they're there, and, um, and, and they don't always uh, see eye to eye with uh, the conservatives in the House. And so it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough sledding. And one more thing here, and let me pull up, and folks, by the way, a lot of you can follow me on YouTube, and I want to put this shout out here. Uh, If you're watching back on this on my YouTube channel or Congressman Biggs' YouTube channel, uh, please like and subscribe. I see your YouTube channel has grown quite a bit recently, Congressman. So wherever you're watching this, please please do that because we want to get the word out. But I'm pulling up a picture here on the screen of Representative Emanuel, and it wasn't a good start. (laughs) To the swearing oh, you in. mean Emmanuel Cleaver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cleaver, yeah. Prayer. yeah, and I'm yeah. not going to uh, play the audio again because I did that a couple times yesterday. But I mean, what is this a mindset there that, I mean, us folks in like the rest of the country, we can't even conceive how off the rails it's gone? Yeah, that's right. So I, I, I liken it to if you walk in, you're dealing with my friends on the other side of the aisle, the Democrats. Yeah. And you, and it, it'd be like you walking into the most liberal uh, campus of a university in America <laughs> and, and walking in and with a conservative point of view and you want to talk about John Locke and freedom and maybe Frederick Hayek or whatever it is you want to talk about. They just don't get it. And they're really out of touch. They're out of touch with the mainstream in America. Yeah, and that was cute. And, and just as a reminder, if you weren't listening yesterday, he's at the end of the the prayer. He said, "A man and a woman," and it was like it doesn't even it didn't even make sense from a historical or dictionary <laughs> point of view. It was it was stupid. No. It was just stupid. He yeah. was just trying to get a headline, I think. I, I don't know what I don't know what in the world that was. About. <laughs> that was that was just odd. But it's but it's consistent. So so. Um, so they're they're attacking me, saying, "Well, it's not true." Basically, what Big says that that you aren't going to be able to say father, husband, brother, son. Mm. And I said, "Well, why don't you read your own rules?" Yeah. They said, "Yeah, he hasn't read the rules." No, no, we've looked at them pretty good, pretty well. We we I think we know what what they're doing. They're they they just don't want to tell the Americans straight up what's going on. They want us. They're also they're also wanting to discipline what we put on our on our uh, websites and our social media. And uh, this is just uh, outrageous. That's Orwellian. Yeah, that's Orwellian. Big Brother within Congress. They want to actually watch and monitor your, like, congressional site, your your public sites. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. And um, and this is, that's the authoritarianism that I I, I often say is inherent in in, uh, the leftist uh, uh, philosophy in America today. All right, folks, we are talking with uh, Congressman Andy Biggs, who's the chairman of the House Freedom Caucus, and uh, obviously a big vote today in Georgia that will determine the Senate, uh, and but then a big vote tomorrow and uh, as far as certifying the election results and the presidency, and we've already laid out how we think this is going to go. Um, Congressman, they laid out these rules, uh, Speaker Pelosi and, and her her buddies as far as how you're going to operate and then we had the prayer where they're talking about a man a woman they're talking about gender neutral language and i'm thinking to myself and one or two of my listeners will get aggravated because i talk about the national debt and the condition we're in right now quite a bit and a lot of people say to me andy they're like why do you keep talking about this it doesn't matter nobody's listening nobody cares um and that there's nothing you can do about it. And I'm pretty convinced there's almost nothing we can do about the national debt and the deficit problem at this point. But I'm trying to prepare everybody for what probably will happen if we go down this road. Look at this. This is the official numbers, $3 trillion deficit. We know it's higher than that. Federal spending, $7 trillion, probably going up to 8 maybe more. Is there even a talk about it anymore? Yeah, well, it's hard to get a, get up a, a, a few con- conversations with it. I, I, I I know who I can go and talk to here about it and have a serious discussion about it. Uh, there is talk. It's always uh, not the right time, though. That's yeah. what they always tell me. Yeah. It's not the right time. And I say, well, when is the right time? When is the right time to actually address 
uh, spending, the national debt, the structural deficit. When is that? When is that? Well, you know, now we've got a pandemic. Well, what was it before that? Mm-hmm. Uh, we, were, we were in a, a slight recessionary uh, trend. Well, what was it before that? Well, we had an inflationary period. They, they, they find every excuse they possibly can to perpetuate spending. And so, so some of us who come to them and, and really put, try to put pressure on them, uh, they, they view us with great disapprobation. They don't want to, to talk. And I'm not talking about a single – I'm not talking about just the Democrats. I'm talking about there's a lot of Republicans as well. Oh, no. I mean, absolutely. We saw that with the stimulus. So, I mean, we're going to – if you had to uh, play this out, um, where do we go then? Because we, we heard the talk that this is – we're going to continue with the COVID issues. And it's going to go on for a long time. I mean, do we have a four trillion, five trillion dollar deficit next year too? I mean, how does this? Pe- do they pencil this out? Is, do they war game this, Congressman? They do not war game this. Come on, man. <laughs> think about this. It's people like me who look at it and say, um, uh, and I go to the folks. They, I was told that we were going to start the year um, with a two and a half trillion dollar structural deficit. Yeah. For, for the current fiscal year that we're in now. And we are, what, three months into the uh, three or four months into this fiscal year. And uh, the question is, how much will it exceed that? And the spending packages that just came out will push that up, uh, in my opinion, by another trillion or so, at least. Unbelievable. But then how do they justify? I mean, people are frustrated with the Sudan thing, the Egypt thing, the Vietnam thing, the Ukraine thing. How do they pencil all this out? And, and how are the people just... How long do the people well, what, put up with this? Well, uh, hopefully not much longer. But <laughs> I mean, the the way they the way they justify it, they'll say, uh, you know, uh, well, we need to do this to keep them on our side, to uh, keep peace there, blah blah blah. And and you know, as bad as the the foreign aid spending is, I can tell you what, if we if we sat down and looked at our budget, you would you would find so many domestic programs. Oh yeah. Uh, that you'd say, oh my goodness, and they all spend more. So so. But never forget that the that when the Democrats are in charge and and the left gets in charge, uh, a lot of this is is for odd things. I mean, so for us to give twenty nine million dollars to the Afghan security forces to do gender equality in the Afghan security forces, I want you to understand you have a significant portion of Afghan Afghanistan that still is uh, trying to operate under Sharia law. Mm-hmm. And when you give money to, to Pakistan, $10 million as well. And then when you send out money um, for uh, early childhood development around the world, uh, you're, you're, you're ignoring uh, the mantra that, that President Trump always said was America first. Yeah. Make America great. And as we are great, then we can lift others. But yeah, we, we we managed to to to, to uh, self immolate all the time when we budget. Yeah, you think they laugh when they get this, and you think what what suckers these people are. You know, I mean, you think someone in Afghanistan is like gender studies or gender equality, and they're like, thanks. Well, well, well here, here, here's the way it, it works. I mean, I mean, it's, it's going to work in one of two ways: either either somebody's going to uh, skim off the top, mm-hmm. or or and and you're going to have to really make sure you've got accountability or you're going to see oh some think tank in new york is going to uh, go take a send a couple of people over some trips to afghan afghanistan and meet with uh some of the generals of the security forces over there um get their opinions do a a, a poll or two and then come back and make recommendations yeah that, you, that's the kind of garbage you, you see and it happens routinely in uh washington yeah DC. some think tank bureaucratic uh cubicle uh what was it that elon musk says maybe a few too many mbas going on right now thinking <laughs> thinking thinking stuff up <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> maybe not not exactly. picking on people with mba there's plenty of smart people out there but there's also a lot of useless stuff that happens okay uh, congressman i know you got to go i want to finish up here um you mentioned the border earlier and security and you know we've seen this influx that can happen uh if you just decide to have open borders again i, I looked at your twitter feed uh 450 miles of border wall um it, there has been a lot of stride uh, or, or strides under President Trump. Yes, yeah, that's right. And so, and I think he's trying to get five hundred. It's possible to get maybe five hundred uh, 
uh, miles out before uh, the 20th of January. They've got crews working uh, double double shifts, etc., trying to trying to uh, get things done. Is, is what I've been told. Okay. But uh, here's the way to think of it: during during the surge, we had as many as 35,000 people in custody, and now we have a thousand people in custody. Title 42 allows uh, border patrol agents to turn back folks who are coming into the country illegally just immediately turn them back um and and then you also have the stay in mexico policy which still remains in in place but those when those go away the floodgates open uh the reason that you you you've seen uh one caravan form the reason that 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 we're seeing a movement is that the cartels know that if biden is the president especially if if they get the senate as well they're going to change our laws. ICE, ICE had a reduction in funding in, in the NDAA bill. Uh, they're they're trying to attack C- CBP. They want to turn them into uh, basically a search and rescue um, operation instead of a border security operation. You're going to see like to help them back across and stuff. Like if they get in trouble. Yeah, you no, know, yeah, go, go out and rescue them, which they okay. already do. Okay, that's one of the things they already do. But all these provide incentives and lures to come into the country illegally. And as that happens, um, I'm just going to tell you that that's why um, we're seeing this massive – it's not even getting any play in the media. There's a massive surge of people trying to get into our country today. Fortunately, they're being turned around. But they're just waiting. But they know. They follow the – They know. They know what's they know. happening. The, yeah. Yeah, the, car, the cartels are advertising again like they, they did before. The NGOs up here – the do-gooding NGOs are advertising down there, and uh, what the what some of those people fail to understand is they actually f- uh, facilitate and contribute to human and sex trafficking, uh, and certainly drug trafficking, uh, by uh, by facilitating and advertising uh, ways to get up here and how to how to beat the system. Yeah. So you're going to see a lot of things that look reminiscent of uh, of Obama era. Um, um, policies. Yeah, third term, first term for Kamala. Um, okay, Congressman, um, real quick, looking ahead, biggest fear going into, we're in 2021, um, but but leave us with some optimism too, <laughs> please. <laughs> well, the, the, the optimism I have is that I th- American people are very resilient, mm-hmm. and, I, and I do believe that uh, the Democrats will overstep and what that means is that that Americans will reject that. Americans will say no. Too much. We, yeah. we are free people. That's too much. And that's that's what that's what I keep hanging my hat on. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll stay away from the negative. We've already kind of gone over that, I guess. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Congressman. And again, folks, hey, go go subscribe to his YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, wherever you're watching this, and uh, we really appreciate that. And uh, I might see you next week. I may join you down at the border. Uh, we'll see. Oh, we'll great. see how that yeah. goes. Yeah. And, and do a tour. We'll, you know how it is scheduling and make, making all that happen. So, uh, best wishes to you here tomorrow. Good luck with the. Uh, Thank you. The the um, thanks, Jeff. Constitutional process. We'll talk with you soon. All right, folks. Yeah, it's it's an interesting process for sure, and um, we'll see what happens. It doesn't sound obviously obviously we're all we're realists, and we know um, what's going on in in Washington tomorrow, and that it's it's highly improbable that that this is going to pan out uh, the way many of us would like it to for President Trump. But the reality is, and what what happens? What what's next? Because so many people, and Congressman Biggs kind of brought this up. So many people are frustrated with the process, and um, so many people. I brought this up to be reasonable. So many people, you know, they don't, they didn't believe in the election integrity before this, and I'm talking about people on the left. I mean, look, we spent four years of people claiming that President Trump's presidency was illegitimate and now there's going to be so many of us who are going to be like well this president is illegitimate and where does that end it's it's not good and we've covered a lot here on the on the program it's a scary time um i i I share this story with you i went out to you know i went out last weekend with my kids and olivia and owen were on the program yesterday and you can get that uh by going to the the, the podcast you can go to talkwithjeff.com you can hear the podcast back on uh, uh on spotify or on youtube uh from yesterday's show but we talked about we went out to do a little quail hunting 
and we didn't get any quail. Uh, we, we tried. Um, but of course, the kids want to shoot afterwards since we didn't get to shoot at any quail. And so we decided to do a little target practicing on uh, the box of uh, empty, in this case, 20 gauge uh, shells and uh, did a 22 and then did a 20 gauge and, you know, popped off a few rounds to have some fun. Well, I figured today, this morning, I went out and I figured that um, I would replace the rounds that we burned off that I had bought a couple years ago when there was, you know, when you could go to any store that sells ammunition and um, there was just mountains and, and piles of this stuff, right? So I go out and store after store uh, was either completely out. There's a couple that you couldn't get anything um, or, uh, you know, very limited supply and you can have one box. I don't know if we have it here, but whatever. But anyway, my, uh, John Kistler gave me a lead on getting some um, um you know, and, and every place has a little bit of something. And thanks, John, for that. And replenished my uh, 20 gauge and my uh, 22 rounds that we used. But I'm, I'm pointing this out because there's there's two issues here. And I'll bring in specialists on this soon. But there's a supply issue because things are just so choked up because of the way people have closed down uh, businesses and manufacturing and their limited capacity, limited capacity on raw materials. I've told you about this, trying to buy any kind of quantity of screws or, or hardware fasteners, things like that. Um, there's supply problems, and I don't see that letting up anytime soon. But back to the ammunition side, I think this ties in with just the concern everyone has going forward. You have a supply issue, but then that propagates the, oh, we're running out of stuff. Think toilet paper. But it's much more than toilet paper with the ammunition. People are truly concerned about the state of this country and about um, look look what happened. More of this, more of these riots, more of this looting keeps it keeps going on. You don't hear about it every day, but it's happening. And I was, I was talking to one person today, and they were telling me uh, this was at another shop. They were telling me that um, they've seen just a record number of of single uh, uh, ladies and single moms coming in to buy new firearms, first time firearms buyers. And, and I think that's, it's incredible. And I'm glad that the second amendment's finally catching on, but it goes to show you how uncertain everyone is going forward. And that's a huge concern. And, you know, I take stock of it every day. I think we all are because we, we see how vulnerable the whole uh, situation is. So I don't know what's to come. We'll see what happens tonight. Uh, in Georgia, maybe. Maybe we'll have the, the numbers, but the Republicans need to hold on there. They need to for the sake of our country. And uh, we, we'll see what happens tomorrow. I think we know what's going to happen tomorrow with the vote certification in, in Congress. But Georgia is so critical. And I hope that tomorrow on the program, we'll have those results and we'll be able to talk about it because tomorrow is open line Wednesday. We'll do two full hours of your live listener comments. And yes, we'll take your comments. All comments are welcome. We will fit as many calls on as the two hours permit. So I hope you'll participate. Ed, we want to hear from you as well. And folks, keep up with me by going to talkwithjeff.com. Please like the podcast, go to talkwithjeff.com. You can follow us on Spotify. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel. And I would really, really appreciate that if you do that. And we'll be back here tomorrow, 406 with Open Line Wednesday. I hope you'll join us. Folks, have a great, safe night and we'll see you soon. You're listening to The Jeff Orovitz Show. 